Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So my next interview was a real treat. It's, uh, you know, most of my interviews are a real treat. I just, I love conversation. And, 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 and what's really wonderful in this COVID era, if I find myself, we find ourselves in, is that a lot of my interviews now are on Zoom. And uh, I actually get a little closer uh, to face to face. I mean, it's still, you know, a digital representation, but it's live. And I was just thrilled to be able to have a conversation in, uh, with Philippe Falardeau, uh, the director of Monsieur Lazare. You may remember that film. And if you don't, you need to look it up. It's an uh, Oscar nominated film. And uh, this new film, uh, My Salinger Year with uh, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Philippe and I uh, talked a great deal about about writing and about art and 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 about relationships and and so we we started out with this the fact that we were kind of face to face and we stepped into a you know that 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 need to connect with others and how important uh, this film is and this story is and how important it is just for all of us to remember. And so, you know, a little shout out, if you haven't, haven't done it, if you haven't connected with someone recently, uh, do, do it in the very near future, go for a walk, wear a mask if you need to, but uh, make sure you reach out and you, you step in. And that's something Philippe talks a great deal about. And, and I think this film is really all about that as well. JD Salinger, you know, who hasn't read the catcher in the rye, I think is the question, but it, it's a film about so much more than that and it's it's a message in a bottle if you will and i think philippe talks a little bit about that and about writing and and the difference between writing and dire- uh, directing and how he fires the screenwriter in the editing room which is just a whole lot of fun and he talks about this notion of not waiting and how the pre- past and the present and and the future won't wait he com- the film is a real comment uh, on technology as well and philippe gets into that and and about uh, you know as as an artist and as artists and really frankly as human beings really we all need to take risks and this existential um, human uh, part of being human is is about stepping into the future. And to do that, you really do have to reach out. You have to connect with others and you have to commit. You have to take those risks. And in, in that, uh, you know, with that sentiment in mind, what what is your, you know, your next move? He talks about having to lie to tell the truth. We, we get into context and culture. We touch on a whole lot of things. Just a real pleasure having Philippe on, on, on face-to-face. And I so ha- had wished, as I do with most of my interviews, I wished it was live and in front of an audience. It would have been so delightful to be able to interact with a real crowd and, and get Q&A as well. My Salinger year coming right up in the near future. Uh, check it out online. Uh, but before we go there, davidpecklive.com for more information about my writing and speaking. You can purchase a copy of Real Changes Incremental there or even go to Amazon and do it there, chapters as well. I would love it if you did that. And if you wound up listening to this interview through iTunes or Spotify or one of the usual suspects, please check out uh, the site, face-to-facelive.ca, over 530 interviews. Sign up for the newsletter. You can advertise with us. Reach out if you're interested. And more importantly, please leave us a review. If you're listening to this on YouTube, leave us a thumbs up. Uh, give us a few stars and, and a comment. We would so appreciate it. It really does make a difference. It's the splash and ripple effect. And incrementally, it, it adds up. And there are people out there who won't even look at my invites if I don't have several hundred uh, reviews. So we're working towards that and uh, look for a new website coming in the very near future for face-to-face as well. So many great interviews right now we have online and coming up, but uh, a real pleasure this one. Uh, My Salinger Year is the film starring Sigourney Weaver and uh, Philippe Falardeau online uh, on face-to-face coming right up. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We're joined by a very special guest here with us today. And believe it or not, I think this is about my 540th interview with uh, a person of interest. How's that, Philippe? A person of interest. You are a lucky person. I don't get to talk to that many interesting people. Well, hey, let's say let's say hello to Philippe Falardeau here today to talk about uh, his new film, My Salinger Year. Uh, And um, yeah, so Philippe, thank you for joining me today. And I'm so glad we could connect. We actually are connecting face to face, but unfortunately, we can't even do an elbow bump. But uh, we are finding ways to connect. That's that's what's important. Yeah, and despite everything. And isn't that the job of a filmmaker? 
it is finding ways um, to connect. It is, and and uh, it's a nice entry to the interview because I think it's 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 also uh, one of the one of the topic. It's also at the core of the film uh, our need to connect and and. Uh, uh, because um, because this, the, 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 the main character, Joanna Rakoff, uh, has to answer all of Salinger's fan mail and, and, and uh, she feels awful in responding this, this, this with this general, generic form, form letter and she understands intimately how important it is to, 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 for people to try to connect with the artist that moves them. So we make work of art, or try to, uh, um, or it, it could be a, a, a sports person, uh, but we have an effect on people, and it's not a one-way street. We have to expect that there is going to be uh, a feedback at some point, and more than a feedback, but a will to connect with, our, with, with us. Um, but it, it becomes impractical and impossible when it's in the realm of stars, and, and, and certainly characters like J.D. Salinger was a recluse. Um, a recluse but, from from about 1965, right? Like, exactly. Well, yeah. in 1963, he stopped uh, responding to his his fan mail, and I, I understand why. It, sure. it must have been overwhelming number wise, but also content wise. Oh. It, it it's just not possible. But on my level, it's certainly possible, and I am sensible to that. Uh, and and I do respond to people who write to me. Um, as people have responded to me when I wrote to them, I wrote to filmmakers, uh, to authors, I got some response and that helped shape the person I am today. And, and that's so that's amazing. why I was moved by that in the book. I, a friend of mine, uh, who's a philosopher theologian, wrote a letter to Martin Sheen uh, many years ago and said that Apocalypse Now and his portrayal, et cetera, had this profound impact. So he handwritten letter, fires it off this is i don't know what 20 years ago yeah martin responds wow and says what a beautiful i'm getting goosebumps what a beautiful note uh, brad thank you for that i had no idea that my my portrayal in this film would have theological implications <laughs> i mean you know isn't that isn't that a beautiful thing philippe and no, doesn't and that you energize do, you as a director and a writer you do have to take a risk and 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 send your message out there because depending on what you are saying and what you have to say, even if it's the star, it might reach the person and it might touch them in a way that they haven't been touched before. You have to realize that these people meet more people in one day or one year than you meet in in a life, so they can't respond to everyone. But but you 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 have something to say. You 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 send it like a a message in a bottle and sometimes it comes back. Nice. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a great reminder. I, I'm always disappointed when, you know, big stars turn me down for interviews on Facebook. <laughs> well, I, well I, if I, you I, have, if you have any connections, let me know. I'm not but that I, but, big. I couldn't turn you down. <laughs> but, but, but you know what point? Well taken message in a bottle because that message, it could be short, it could be simple, could arrive at the right place and the right time. And, and, and have an impact beyond, you know, as crazy as this sounded, beyond our wildest dreams, that whole, you know, dropping the pebble in the pond, right? I mean, look at, look at the impact of, and I know if, if, if J.D. Salinger was listening in, he wouldn't want to talk about the catcher and the ride. By the way, I brought my copy here from high school just as, you know, uh, blew my mind as a teenager. I brought it today just out of respect for you and for JD, <laughs> but I bet I bet as a as a as a star he would not want to have talked about this book and had he couldn't have imagined no. the impact that this probably book at this the beginning could, maybe at the beginning but but certainly crazy, out right? the road and and we're still we'll still we still read him in high school today so so we're talking about millions of copies sold and 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 but. Uh, Coming back to the idea of the message in a bottle, I think the act of writing what you have to say is good in itself. It doesn't have, even if it doesn't reach the person, it's like writing in your own journal. You do it because you have to, because you, have, you feel the, the urge to put something on paper. It can be something that, that bothers you. It, it can be something that, that has to get out there in some form or shape. And, and the act of writing is actually very therapeutic. Uh, well, I don't know. Yeah, very, how partic it? very particular. Ther no, thera Thera oh, therapeutic. 
peer approved it. Yes, yes of course, exactly. of course. Yeah. So yeah. even if it doesn't reach the person, I think uh, if you feel the, the urge to write, um, it's like feeling the urge to uh, to go walk or to to do something that's good for you. Um, writers, in a sense, can't not write. Right? They have they have to write. Apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I'd love to hear more about that as a as a as a writer, director, uh, and a producer. I mean, do you consider yourself a bit of a a, a one man show in a sense? No, it's two distinct parts. That uh, because the writing part is so different from directing, and and it it it, it taps on to different needs and qualities you have. And I don't, I don't, I can't say I have, I have the urge to write per se, but I have to, the urge to communicate for sure. Mm. And to digest things I see, I live or I read or experience and, and try to transform it. Um, but it's certainly two different um, uh, jobs. And, and, and to a point where actually when I direct the film, I, Sometimes I can ask the screenwriter inside of me for some answers, especially when I find out that my dialogues are not working or we mm. need something to fit the environment more. And, and then I can ask the crew to wait like 15 minutes and I'll go write a scene and I'll come back to the dialogues. But I certainly fire the screenwriter when I'm in the editing room. Because <laughs> now it's another, it's another logic completely. When you assemble your film as in the screen play, it doesn't really make any sense anymore. It takes a life hmm. of its own, and and you need it's 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 you need to 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 measure the quality of your work in with different tools, and you need to craft it with different tools. So I I do kill myself. I I assassinate the screenwriter in me, which is a good thing. It's me, so I don't commit a, you know a big. <laughs> It's not, it's not illegal, I think. Uh, but, um, so, but I've worked also with other uh, screenwriters and I've, I've, I've made it clear that when you get into the, 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 the editing room, uh, it's another thing completely. Uh, I, I, do, I do welcome notes like anyone uh, on, the, on, the, on the cut, but uh, it's two different things. So you don't you don't have an urge to write, and let's we need to talk about the film. And by the way, congratulations on the film um, and and the cast. Uh, fast fascinating. I mean, as soon as I saw it come into my inbox, I was interested. Uh, I'd love to hear why you were dialed into that, and I also want to hear about the fact that you actually were able to watch this with a real audience. But so you you said earlier yeah. you don't have the urge to write, but do you have the urge to tell stories? Is that kind of what I heard? Yes, I have the urge to to transform, to try to transform. That is art, I guess, because in the word art, there is some there's something artificial. You take something and you make it you make it yours, and you make something else out of it. It's like taking a piece of wood. It's to, it's wood. It was to, it used to be a tree. You carve it, it becomes something else. It becomes, but it, it doesn't become. If you carve a duck, it doesn't become a duck. It becomes a representation of a duck. Films are are, are the same it's a representation of your point of view on life so i enjoy that i need that i do enjoy writing and i do feel the urge sometimes to to write but it's a it's a difficult process and it can be painful so by itself it's not sufficient i need the output which is film and in this case also communication with the audience uh, and feedback from the audience and feedback from you guys um, so i i came about the book by a big happenstance, uh, I was going to see a movie, and I, I was I was early, so I went into the library nearby, and I was looking for some material about women or written by a woman, maybe to inspire a next film or or whatever. And I picked three books: one uh, on Lee Miller, the war photographer, and one about Cleopatra. And I'll never make a film about it because I don't I won't have budget for that. Uh, right. And and uh, to an Arakov's book and brought it home, read it, moved me. I could identify my uh, with with Joanna uh, when it comes to that per period of your life where you have so many decisions in front of you. You are overwhelmed by the by them. You you have some dreams. You want some things you want to do. Some things you're good at. Some things you need to do. Uh, and in hindsight, 
this is a very exciting period in our lives, but when we're in it, we feel overwhelmed. So I could identify with that. And I thought this could be turned into a film. Now there were some uh, problems and, and challenges because it does deal with the world of literature and book and letters. So how do you convey that visually without, you know, literature can sound boring as a subject for a film. The subject's not literature. It's just trying to figure out what you want to do in life. Um, is, would, I mean, so much going on in the film, by the way, for me too. And, and I usually take lots of notes when I'm watching. And sometimes I have to go back and watch a second time because there's such a distraction. Well, what did they say? And, you know, trying, trying to capture moments and lines and shots and metaphor and all of that. And I can imagine what it's like living in the head of a screenwriter. It must be, uh, you know, a, like a, like a Home Depot that's, that's, that's been, you know, chaos. Cha chaotic Home Depot, right? Just like, you know, <laughs> things are everywhere. Was this film for you a comment on where we are currently in the 21st century, this TikTok age that we live in? You know, Margaret, Sigourney Weaver's character, you know, I hope this email thing is a trend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't trust those computers. You know, where's that blanket? Let's put the blanket over the computer, you know? Uh, something about her trusting a typewriter more than the keyboard from a computer. So, I, I mean, I, I, I haven't read Joanna's book, um, but, but I'm wondering how much of that came out of your heart, soul, and mind as well. Well, it was certainly sexy and appealing in the book and funny the way she, she, uh, she tells it, uh, when, the way she recalls that moment in her life. But I could identify to that because we, I lived it. I, I, when I was first in my, uh, at the university, I went from typewriter to computer, like an old computer where the hard disk was, wow, 10 meg. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 10 meg hard disk. Uh, and then, then, then you get like internet in the mid nineties. And I remember saying to someone, internet is, is going to fade away. And the person who was an advocate of internet, he said, no, all the knowledge of the world at the tip of a finger. I said, all the knowledge, you think you're going to find knowledge in the internet? And I was wrong. He was, he was right. And, and so I could identify to that. And I didn't want to bring back that time for nostalgic reasons but certainly document it was in a fun way in a playful way and I, the, the character of the boss certainly is a, a nice uh, vehicle to to convey that 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 idea that we can hold on to the past but it does you know the the past the, the the present doesn't wait and the future doesn't wait uh, now also what what it means to, for the book industry and, 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 and in a way, metaphorically, for the film industry, because what is discussed in, in, the, in the, you know, the disappearance of book, we've talked about that. It seems now during the, the pandemic that books are not disappearing. They're actually, they're making a comeback. Um, so films are, are, the way we show films, that is changing also. Um, it, it's, it's a lot of streaming, a lot of online. Will theater disappear? I don't think. I think it will be transform. I think there will be both at the same time. Um, so we're very much still in it 25 years later. <clears throat> Yeah, it's it's fascinating to see where we're heading. I have friends who in the entertainment industry, comics, magicians, people who perform for a living and have been making <clears throat> their living at this cruise ship performers who have been shut down entirely and yeah. trying to figure out how do you connect. And I love your comment earlier about that idea of connection and, and the way we started the interview. And it, doesn't Joanna say at some point in the film, uh, for the last several months, I've been reaching out to anonymous names. You know, just these 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 individuals and this something. That I love how those stories captured her enough to break the rules of this company to actually connect with these with these other human beings. In yeah, a way what's that made sense in the film and in the book is that it's not so much Salinger, Salinger's work or presence because she does talk to Salinger on the phone that will influence her but the fan mail and what she did with the fan mail. And she says that she was, she was, she was moved by anonymous people and she starts reflecting on that. And, and this is a reflection. This is a, something I've thought about a lot, getting some fan mails and some love from the public and sometimes from some harsh criticism. 
So you get an answer. What do you, what do, you do with that answer? What, what will be your next move? And, and this is exactly what is happening in, in Joanna's life, but it has a resonance that will affect not only her professional life, but also her sentimental life. And so it doesn't quite happen like that in the book, but I tried to synchronize the effect of the fan mail on her sentimental life and professional life and personal life at the, at the same time so that it all comes together at the, you know, towards the end with uh, another fantasized um, uh, moment in her life. Uh, I used a lot of that in the movie because, like I said, conveying literature or written words in film can be can be hard and dull. And so I tried to use Joanna's fantasies and projections and made them come, make them come alive uh, uh, with, with, with just the right amount of realism, but mostly um, uh, uh, playfulness because um, it, it's really about Joanna's mind. Uh, um, um, so, and it was the part where I think the real author, Joanna Rockoff, encouraged me to go further. Uh, when she read the first version, she said, I love what you, what you invent from what I've written, and I would encourage you to go even further in that direction. And she understood that this is, those are two different mediums, and the forces of literature are not the same than the forces of, of cinema, and I had to find the forces of cinema. She, uh, she was an executive producer on the film as well, I would imagine. So does that mean she was hands-on in a sense? She was, uh, she was not hands-on at all. Um, she, she was very encouraging. She was pivotal in helping me to convey what it was to be a young woman in, in, in Manhattan in the 90s. I'm, I, I'm French-Canadian from, from Gatineau, Quebec, so obviously I needed a bridge there. And like I said, she, she, she stirred me, she steered me in, 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 in the right direction at, sometimes, but encouraged me to use fiction to convey what happened in her life. And she, I, I remember her saying at some point to a journalist in Berlin that it, was, it became unclear when she was seeing the movie what, was, what happened and what didn't happen in real life because for her, everything made sense in the film. That was probably the best compliment I could get you know, uh, for the film. I was talking, you know, I, I just need to ask you this just because you sort of went here and and we still haven't talked about that real world film festival that seems to be a thing of the past for the time being. But um, I was talking to my, my, my brother this morning and, and he was reflecting on a film that he'd seen recently and he made a comment about, oh, you know, I think it was pretty close to being true. And I always find that interesting, you know, your comment about how Joanna said, use fiction to tell my truth, basically is what she said. And I love that, Philippe. Can you talk about that a tiny bit as that assassinated screenwriter and director? <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, the fact that things don't need to be certain in order to be true, if that makes any sense at all. No, when I, and, and, and it, 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 there is, there is a body of work of fiction out there that is there to entertain us and to, to bring us into worlds that, won't exist, don't exist, will never exist. But at the same time, they won't move us if it doesn't tap on something that's, that's true. And, and so writing a novel, a first novel, or memoirs, it's based on your real life. It's always based some, somewhat sure. on your experience. So yeah, you have to lie to tell the truth. Uh, it's, it's a harsh way to put it, but it's, it's what we do. Uh, it's not lie, lies per se. But I remember the reaction of someone from my first film, which was a, a mockumentary. La Moitié Gauche du Frigo, the left-hand side of the fridge, was a mockumentary. So it was, they were all actors and it was scripted, but it was shot in a way that you thought it was a real documentary. And I was presenting the film in an art house cinema and, and doing a Q&A at the end. At one point, a man stood up and said, are you telling us that nothing is real in the film? And I thought it was, you know, it was known, it was accepted by everyone that that was a mockumentary that was actually fiction. But he took it for, really, he was deeply hurt. And I said, I'm so sorry. It was, I didn't mean to fool anyone, but at the same time, this, what is, this, this was fiction does. It, it lies to, to tap on some of truth or my truth, and it could be also part of your truth. 
Yeah, I think, yeah, there's something about it. The idea, uh, I've studied philosophy for years and you get hung up on this idea of words being true when in actual fact, in my mind, the words point to truth. So like you say, you need to sort of lie to tell the truth because we all have that experience and that lived experience. And I think it's an amazing, I I love that about film and I love that about storytelling. But don't you think that there needs to be a convention though that's clear because yeah you can you can play around with a mockumentary and you can but but the convention at the end of the day has to be clear because words can point to the truth but they also can point to something that's terribly false and we are Absolutely. experiencing that right now in politics uh in in a way that we've never experienced it it's so blatant that it, that it, it's a we, gong show right mm-hmm. like you completely you, 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 you because watch the convention, it and you can't believe it Totally, and because the convention is not clear anymore, and 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 the protocol is not clear anymore. Right. right. So in in art, at, at least you don't you don't try to fool anyone because there's the label. It's it's a work of art. Doesn't mean that it's artistic. <laughs> and I don't mean that it's it's beautiful and artistic, but it means that the convention is clear. It's it's uh, it's something that I've, that we've tried to do. We transform reality, and we try to convey something by doing that it seems you know it's interesting to me and i i think we we probably have to wrap up soon but there's so 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 many wonderful things we could talk about in this film it's what i love so love about about great storytelling and great film you can, you can go so many places i used to be a part of a film club and you know it sounds really nerdy and boring but you know what a group of people we'd get together we'd have dinner glass of wine watch Do you miss film. those i really miss those yeah i really miss those and uh and, and, and go a little deeper and it would be amazing. Somebody would, would, would observe something that no one else in the room saw and went, whoa, I need to go yeah. back and see, right? And yeah. isn't, isn't that beautiful, right? Isn't that a beautiful thing? And, and um, I'm wondering, what are you seeing about the story, the film that you didn't see before? What are connections are you making today that you weren't making when you were in the editing room, for instance? Well, I think it's true not only of this film, but uh, first of all, my interpretation of the film is almost irrelevant when it's, once it's, it, it, it comes out. And right. unless someone says, your film promotes fascism, I will say, mm, no, I don't accept that interpretation. I deny it. But otherwise, I mean, your interpretation is as good as mine. And you are right in saying that when you do something, you start writing, you think it's about something. Then you start shooting it. And then you say, oh, it was about that. And then you edit the film and say, oh, boy, was I wrong. That's it's so about good. that. <laughs> and, and I think when I watch my own films, I completely abandon the idea of trying to say what it's about. I did it in my, with my first films. I tried to say, no, this is about that. And now I, I'm more relaxed about it. And I welcome uh, hearing about what is the film uh, pointing to from the perspective of, of another person from from different audiences and that's why I miss traveling with the film also because you jump from one country and, and an, to another I remember Monsieur Lazar hmm. uh, which is the film that traveled the most and I went to Japan and they just experienced the the, the earthquake there and many people lost their li- lost close ones and Monsieur Lazar is about grieving and for them it was about national grieving they 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 were focused on that michelle Azar was about that the teacher was like the head of the country and 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 the head the head the schoolmaster was the, the the maternal figure and and so they had this old paradigm for monsieur Azar that was close to them having experienced that that trauma i so this, this taught me a lot about just letting go of the interpretation of my own film can, can you talk a little bit about that? It sounds like you're disappointed, obviously, that you're not traveling. I, I was able to do a few hot docs, Q&As, and a few along the way. And I remember talking to to one filmmaker, Mia Donovan, uh, about her film, a really interesting, brilliant film, Dope as Death, and, and need to see it. And 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 she said, you know, if you're, make, if you're a filmmaker out there, you know, and you're doing kind of a one-off, wait for that actual physical contact. Wait for that face-to-face experience, if you can. You know, um, tell me about Berlin, yeah. about about the difference between you know this Q and A and doing a Q and A in front of five hundred people. Um, well, Berlin was uh, something surreal in the context of today because we 
we showed the film before 2,200 people. And on that same wow. night, I ran to another theater and presented to another theater <laughs> where there were like 1,700 a, a people. Um, there were no Q and A's because the opening film, it's a gala presentation, right. there's no Q and A, but I've lived like, yeah, I've experienced a lot of Q and A's and I think it's, it's the reward. It's the ultimate reward for a filmmaker and, and it's being able to, to uh, engage with the audience. And, and, and also I try also when I do Q and A's to ask questions to the audience about right. the film because I want to learn about my film through their perspective. Now this is, this is lost, but I don't think it's lost forever. Uh, I think, doing what you're, we're doing right now. It's like a radio interview, really. And, and I've done that before. And you know that the audience is there listening and engaged. And, and it is a con it's, it, it's a bit of a one-way conversation, but I'm conscious. I, I choose my words uh, so, so it can mean something to them or try to. So it is a conversation. And I'm, I'm the one who, I'm, I really think that this is not the normal or the new normal and that no state is permanent, especially not this one. And we'll go back to something that we've known before. I remember when the pandemic started, I was just finishing Simone de Beauvoir's memoir and she talks extensively wow. about being confined during the war. Uh, and, and, and this is not the war. This is not a stuff, a second world war. We can deal with this. And if they went through Second World War, we can we can go through, through this, and all things have ending, and 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 maybe the next step will not be exactly the same as we we've experienced it before, but we'll find ways to reach out to each other. Uh, one of the best books I've ever read is the Beauvoir's The Ethics of Ambiguity. Yes, Tur turn my world's upside down. Man's unhappiness is due to his first having been a child, says Descartes. <laughs> The beginning of chapter two it's just unbelievable like just astounding the freedom the choice the responsibility i mean i consider myself an existentialist at heart actually philippe so well i can read i can read the titles on the hundreds of books you have behind you that's oh. what's an advantage that's one of the advantage of doing zooms is that you get it's, into people's intimacy if we were doing this radio i didn't i wouldn't know that you have the capital from karl marx <laughs> you know <laughs> behind you <laughs> Shh. yes don't tell too many people yes yeah I won't word, promise. Word, word might get out on the street yeah <laughs> hey listen can i ask you two more two more yes, questions of course. Uh, i love how you and i love i just love the filmmaking process how you know a character like sigourney weaver and you've got and again you, you've got this cast you've got your editing you're writing you're directing how it comes together in this final piece and i so love what you said about how you're leaving the interpretation up to me you know um margaret says i believe to to joanna you've you, you've got a you've got good instincts and you have a good heart i mean do you consciously say oh that's a great line it's in joanna's novel i'm going to include it i mean and then this is the what was actually fictional versus i mean there's a lot going on in this question but I just, what a beautiful line. And I, and I, and I wonder to be a, an artist with impact, do you need good intuitions and a good heart? I don't know. I think there are some monsters who create wonderful work, work of art, um, unfortunately. And I remember reading Peter Sellers biography and I stopped at some point because Peter Sellers was such for me, a some sort of a hero and when i you know he was not a pleasant man he was not a happy man mm -hmm. but in this case i thought joanna the real joanna when i read her memoir had a good heart and and that's a line that comes from me that's a scene that i wrote and i wanted to convey that to her actually and then when sigourney takes the line and she makes it her own it becomes very emotional very very poignant without being sentimental at all. A lot of restraint in the way she plays it. I like actors who can go there, but use restraint. And she does it very beautifully. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad you pointed out to that scene because I, I think it's beautiful. I also think the scene between the two of them when, she, when, Mark, when Joanna goes to see her boss at home is, is very beautiful also, but full of restraint. And, 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 very, uh, very moving scene. Very moving so, scene. So you have a good heart is, is something is my comment on Joanna Rakoff. 
So one, one last thing, um, and, and listen, this is the only reason it's the last thing is because, you know, we have a limit on this conversation. I'm pretty sure I could talk to you all afternoon. In fact, I'd, I'd like to, but, but you say, you put the words in J.D. Salinger's mouth, you're, you're a writer, Joanna, write. <laughs> Don't get stuck answering the phone. It's just so great. Yeah, I wish I had invented that line, but that comes from the book, Don't Get Stuck Answering the Phone, You're a Poet. I thought, oh, this, I don't know how, but this has to be in the film. And I do get, emo and, and this is where Sigourney Weaver got emotional when she saw the film for the first time. She started mm. to cry there. She mm. wanted to be an author when she was young. She wanted to write books. Wow. It got to her. That line got to her. And it gets to me every time I see the film, the way the guy played it and the way Margaret Qualley takes this in um, and, and and so this man who was supposed to be this crazy idiosyncratic guy is just a normal kind of guy who wants to talk about the weather oh and by the way Joanna remember you're a poet don't get stuck answering the phone I thought I was so beautiful and so typical of the double standards with women a young woman back then wanted to become a writer she became a secretary in a literary agency, a young guy wanted to write. He went to the cafe and he wrote all day right, and he right. didn't care about paying the rent, uh, which was not very, very responsible, but speaks volume about the, the bull standard between you know, women and, and men. Uh, went to the cafe and probably smoked a lot of cigarettes as well, <laughs> I would imagine. It's, uh, uh, Philippe, what a, what a pleasure chatting with you today. And again, congratulations. Thanks for joining me on Face to Face. And for those of you who are listening, if you're enjoying what you're hearing, please give us a like. Go to iTunes, Spotify. Uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, we'd love a thumbs up. Philippe, what a, what a pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about what's next for, for you? Or is I'm that... making a documentary series on the train tragedy in Lac Mégantic. Uh, wow. Seven years after, nothing wow. much has changed. And I think we, people will be surprised to know how unsafe it can be to live well, near a, a railroad uh, with all the uh, dangerous and hazardous goods being shipped around the country. Well, I, I look forward to hopefully interviewing you again. I, I love focusing on documentaries and I've been doing it for years. Hey, where can people see my Salinger year right now? <laughs> uh, well, uh, hopefully at the, the cinema near you. Um, but uh, and, and shortly also on on demand. Yeah. But uh, we are expecting very soon a uh, yeah a release. Uh, mid, we're talking about mid November, but oh, yeah, no, I know. But the, the, basically, the message is, folks, get this on your film to watch list. Yeah. And uh, again, we've been talking with Philippe Falardo, uh here today about his uh, uh, beautiful and moving new film, My Salinger Year. Philippe, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to reach out.